Well, good morning. It's uh, good to be with you. Ryan Jesperson here with uh, John Hicks. Uh, <laughs> first day back, eh? <laughs> it's... Uh, it's uh, <laughs> w- w- what do we what do we say about this? This is check uh, the internet w- connection. We haven't used it in a while. Yeah, we haven't used it in a while. We had to blow <laughs> the dust off a couple of things, and um, here it's, we are. Uh, here we are. So it's been uh, an extended absence on the show <clears throat> for obviously serious reasons. We're laughing. I think one of the reasons, not I think I can tell you. One of the reasons why I'm laughing is because uh, I've got some jitters today. And uh, typically, when I show up to do an episode of Real Talk, I've got my game face on, and and I don't experience the jitters. But these are extenuating circumstances, and it's been a difficult few weeks for our team and and for us individually. And so these technical difficulties that that kept us uh, delayed from launch for about 18 minutes. See, people that are listening to the podcast or watching this later are going to have no idea. It's going to be here, ready, on demand as soon as they want it. Uh, But for those of of our loyal and amazing audience members that show up every single morning at 830 Mountain, 1030 Eastern, uh, there's been a bit of a delay this morning. It's... uh I don't want to say it's two people in a room trying to figure this out. Just remember that. Well, (laughs) and 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 I don't know if yeah, one of us is is completely useless (laughs) uh, on that front. And uh, and uh, actually, I want to give a shout out as well to uh, a former team member of ours, uh, Sam Brooks, who's been in helping you out in troubleshoot this morning. And I'm eternally grateful for that. Uh, Amazing. An amazing friend and a good dude. And we appreciate that. And and, uh, here we are anyway, as they say, in the travel industry, we are wheels up, and it's good to be back with you this morning. Uh, before we get into this, and I know a lot of you will be tuning in uh, for follow-up on uh, the March 17th and March 18th episodes of Real Talk, and, and I'm going to get into that in just a second. You know, this show doesn't happen without the amazing support of our sponsors, and that includes our title, Bitcoin Well. There's a lot going on right now in uh, the world of cryptocurrency and, and some interesting implications was paying attention to what's going on. Did you see the El Salvador's political leadership calling out the United States? They say that uh, cryptocurrency is freedom and Bitcoin is F-U money, says the president (laughs) of El Salvador aimed at the United States. Unbelievable. If you're ever trying to make sense of what's going on in the world of crypto, in particular Bitcoin, I recommend you talk to the team at Bitcoin Well. You can find them under the Sponsors tab on our website, ryanjesperson.com. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. You know, I was listening to uh, Tom Petty's satellite radio channel the other day, and, and from time to time they play archived comments from the late singer. He's one of my favorites of all time uh, in between songs. And in this instance, as uh, Petty was teeing up his hit song, You Don't Know What It's Like, or you don't know how it feels, rather. He said, you don't know what it's like to be me, and I don't know what it's like to be you. And I went, oof. Because it kind of struck me as a pretty bang-on summary of some of the factors that led to what happened the last couple of episodes of Real Talk on March 17th and March 18th before our extended break. And as I just said a couple of minutes ago, it's been a difficult few weeks since those shows, to put it mildly, Um, I know that I disappointed or infuriated a significant element of our amazing and loyal audience. And I hope that you had a chance uh, to check out, to view or listen to the brief message that I posted the afternoon of March 18th. If you subscribe to our podcast or if you check it out on YouTube under our videos, you'll be able to catch it there. I talked about my blind spots and the inherent power dynamic uh, that was at play when the show hit the ditch. And since then, I've been uh, staying out of the public eye, in particular off social media, in order to fully commit to making this right. And I met with members of our editorial board a while ago. I'm so grateful for them. And they shared some specific observations, including uh, where and how exactly I let them down. And one in particular, uh, one of those elements, one of the points that they made was my failure, my inability to read the room on those Thursday and Friday shows, uh, both in the moment and afterward, when it became pretty apparent that my quest for compelling content had compromised my duty to our team. And our board members also shared with me some directives that will influence and improve how we book the show and how we uh, approach 
important but contentious issues. Uh, who chimes in on what? Uh, what we define uh, or how we define our success as a talk show and how we support our staff. And I'm thankful as well for the long list of advocates who either reached out to me or who accepted my invitations uh, to take the time to meet uh, with me or speak over the phone one on one to help me better understand those blind spots. Uh, These people that I spoke with do the work every single day on matters of equity and inclusion and their perspectives have been absolutely invaluable in helping me process not only just what happened on our show, but the reasons why those things happened and the most meaningful ways to recover and to grow stronger moving forward. We received a ton of emails from you, our audience, over the past few weeks to talk at ryanjesperson.com. And as you'd expect, Real Talkers came at this from a bunch of different perspectives. That's one of the beautiful things about this community. And I want you to know that I read every single one of the emails uh, that you passed along. It was an important part of this journey. And right now I want to share with you some of the thoughts and the experiences that you shared with us. Fiona wrote in to say, I'm used to being spoken over, uh, disregarded completely or told that my opinion isn't the right one. She says, I've tolerated a lot of men explaining things to me my entire life when in fact I have a lot of knowledge on many issues Fiona went on to talk about her lived experience and how I would be wise to understand that I do not know this experience. And she's right. She shared how, quote, it's extremely common for women to feel silenced in several arenas in their life. And she suggested that we seek out experts who can speak to power dynamics and to communication related to gender and marginalized communities. She said, now that's an episode that I'll be there for. Um, If you know, we have been having those conversations off air and you have my word that we'll have them on air as well. Meg and Bill, a married couple, told us about a conversation that they had after seeing what unfolded on Real Talk mid-March. And they shared their concern about the my way or the highway approach to sharing opinions and how that's where they believe that society is in real trouble. Uh, Meg and Bill's email gave me a lot to think about regarding the editorial direction of the show. Isabel, a great friend of the show, said, none of us comes out unscathed from growth spurts, but most of us don't have to do it in the public eye. She says, this doesn't negate any of the amazing work the show has done to pry our minds open on other important issues. Um, And it's okay to let us help you do the same. I liked how she put that. She said, you will come out of this as a team, stronger, better, and ready to share how this journey can be an amazing push in forward momentum toward our better understanding of each other. And that really meant a lot. MJ wrote in and said, this has been a really tough lesson in humility and human compassion for us all. MJ said, I myself will listen more attentively and strive to speak more thoughtfully. We all have much work to do. Esther urged us to continue to keep it real. You know how we must strive for personal responsibility of of words and actions, but how we'll never be authentic if our responses are contrived. Esther, you're right about that. Amanda told us about an interaction that she had in a professional setting surrounded by men where she was ignored and talked over and made to feel unintelligent. Amanda went on to talk about the work that she says we all need to do and the work she said even she needs to do to quit putting people like middle-aged white men, those are her words, not mine, into groups and using divisive or hateful language. And I thought that that was a really valuable insight. Sean, one of our Patreon supporters, told us about his far-right upbringing and some of the unlearning that he's been doing. He wrote about how he wouldn't have been able to unlearn his his biases without the help of shows like Real Talk. He said he wrote about the importance of seeking to understand other perspectives and trying to avoid obstacles to understanding. I admire that. Darren told us he's invested hundreds of hours into Real Talk, which I sure appreciate, Darren. And he said, this is a show about conversation and nuance and gray areas and gaining as full of an understanding as possible He talked about the importance of leaving room for debate and how, quote, it's nearly an impossible task. But when we do it well, he said there's no better show out there. All we can hope 
is that you, Ryan, keep working hard to recognize when it's not going well and fix it. Of course, that's the toughest part, isn't it? That's what I've committed my every effort uh, over the past few weeks to doing and what I'm committed to continue doing moving forward. You may know by now that Sarah's decided to not return to the show. And while I'm disappointed, I respect her decision. We met in person on two occasions over the past couple of weeks and had lengthy conversations about our concerns. I care very much about Sarah and I will always value what she brought to this team and I will always be grateful for her time with Real Talk. There's no question that women in media and in general encounter systemic issues that demand action from every one of us. I'm proud to have been recognized in past by groups like the Alberta Council of Women's Shelters and the Center to End All Sexual Exploitation and the Canadian Mental Health Association for my commitment to these important conversations, but it's clear there is still much work to be done. And I will continue that work at personal and professional levels moving forward. I do want to tell you about a couple of other steps that we've taken and that we will take to live up to your expectations of me and of this show and of our company. We're going to be working with an external HR firm to review our processes and and equip our company's leadership with performance management tools and to provide current and future employees with a full suite of HR resources. This will be an ongoing arm's length relationship moving forward. And on a personal note, I'm going to be meeting with a psychologist on a regular basis to ensure that my mental and emotional well-being is receiving the attention that it deserves. I want to be a talk show host, a business leader, a husband, a father, and a friend that sets an example in every aspect of his life. And this experience has reiterated the importance of improving both the on and off camera versions of me. I was at the Battle of Alberta down in Calgary a couple of Saturdays ago, and several Real Talkers came up to me to chime in on everything that's been going on, and it deeply moved me to hear how important this show is to them, to you, you know, how they've appreciated our commitment to meaningful, real conversations about important issues like reconciliation and environmental protection and health care and education, curriculum, ethics and politics and so many others. And that night I was reminded that we have done a lot of good here. And I left the rink that night with a full heart, still beat up for sure, uh, with some self-inflicted wounds, but a full heart nonetheless. A subscriber by the name of Stephanie reached out to me just a couple of days ago, and she said, Real Talk is more important now than ever. And I'm inclined to agree with her. So, Like Tom Petty said, you don't know what it's like to be me, and I don't know what it's like to be you, but I'd like to know. You know, since I was a little boy, I've always wanted to know. I'm curious, and I'm sincere, and I remain committed to seeking to understand, because if we don't, what's the point of all of this? Thank you for your support and your criticism. Thank you for holding me and us accountable. Thank you for your grace and your forgiveness. And thank you for tuning in today. Thank you for your commitment to Real Talk. I mentioned our sponsors and how incredible they've been, not just over these past few weeks, but since this show started. And that includes the team at Kubi Energy, was paying attention to their Instagram. I always do. I encourage you to follow them. The installs they're doing are really remarkable. I'm always coming up with new ideas, new realizations. Oh, yeah. Solar can integrate into that. Right. Kubi's been doing installs across Western Canada that are earning rave reviews because they've got their Tesla certified installers, all of them journeymen or apprentices, residential industrial, commercial, you name it, agricultural, they do it. You can go online and get a free quote today at kubienergy.ca. Our friends at Infinity Healthcare know very well that many of you are 
members of that sandwich generation, right? You're looking after your kids and you're looking after your parents too. And sometimes there's that concern that your loved one that requires care is not getting the adequate care they need. Are they taking their meds? Are they getting their meals? Do they have somebody to just talk to from time to time? Infinity's really proud of their personality matching process, which ensures that their caregivers are a perfect match for you, their clients. You can learn more online at infinity-8.ca or check out Infinity Healthcare right now under the sponsors tab on our website. And our friends at Friesen Brothers want to remind you that on the first of every month, I encourage you to punch it into your phone, circle it on your family's calendar, whatever you do the first of every month. That's when we hit up Friesen Brothers because it's 15% off every grocery purchase of $75 or more. There's 16 locations across the province of Alberta, and Friesen Brothers has been doing business in those communities for more than 65 years. Still family-owned and operating, Friesen Brothers is Alberta-grown and Alberta-owned. Well, there's obviously a lot to talk about right now. It's uh, budget day uh, across the country. If you're tuning in outside Canada, maybe you're don't not paying as, as close attention, but this is a very significant budget, and we're going to be talking about it tomorrow. You won't want to miss my conversation with one of our all-time favorites, Sapria Duvetti. We'll get into the message that the government sends with this federal budget, expecting to see big expenditure. Let me call it a big commitment to affordable health care, to defense Spending. There are implications based on the war in Ukraine. Canada, by the way, still not up with regards to defense expenditures to where NATO wants it. They want 2% of GDP annually. Canada, with this budget, what we're expecting to see will still be sitting at just over 1.3%. So that's something we'll get into tomorrow. And then, of course, in our home province of Alberta, this is a big weekend coming up. You've got Alberta's Premier Jason Kenney and his leadership review set to launch. I probably don't have to tell you, this engaged audience, that more than 15,000 people have signed up to cast a ballot to evaluate the performance of this Premier who needs a, a bare minimum of 50% plus one to retain the leadership, to retain the support of his party. And if he doesn't achieve that, then it'll trigger a leadership race about a year before Albertans are set to go to the polls. That's going to be a fascinating story to follow. And of course, we will have in-depth analysis on everything around that in the days and the weeks to come. We've got this federal coalition, the Liberals and the NDP, and of course, the budget's going to reflect that today. A lot of people that voted for the NDP on principle are, are going to be probably, I imagine, pretty happy to see dental care integrated into this budget. We're expecting to see that. The reporters covering this budget are in lockup right now. And so this afternoon, we'll get more details on what that looks like. And again, we'll get into that tomorrow. You can send us your thoughts on that to talk at ryanjesperson.com anytime. This coalition, I know that it's one that had a lot of people rattled. It's one where a lot of other people said, well, this is exactly what federal politicians or this is what politicians at any level are supposed to do. Find ways to cooperate, find ways to move the needle, find ways to get things done and if you can do that in bipartisan fashion across the aisle, I think that that's something that impresses a lot of people. Of course, it ticked a lot of people off as well, Johnny, because you know it means that Justin Trudeau is going to going to be able to sort of retain that confidence. Yeah, of the House for a while, the Liberals are going to be able to govern for for a full term as opposed yeah. to trying to get out of that minority government territory by calling another election about a year from now. Sure. What did you make of some of the, I mean, a lot of people said this is what politicians are supposed to be doing, cooperating. A lot of other people said they didn't like that coalition at all. Yeah, I saw a tweet where someone was like, oh, the Liberal Party cheat code. The cheat code. <laughs> yeah, let them stick around but, uh, for a little bit longer. I agree. Isn't this how government's supposed to work? You know, we're supposed to band together and try to make things work. Uh, I don't really care what happens as long as uh, the issues we all care about are addressed. I think uh, the big ones for me uh, would be, you know, cost of living, yeah, affordable housing. I mean, you see Ontario, B.C., uh, the housing market just out of control. It's, it's wild. It's starting to happen here. You can see it as well. And uh, I'd say the third one for me would be environment. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, so we'll see that. They're expecting about $10 billion of commitment over five years for affordable housing initiatives. And then the Liberals have been talking a lot, especially through uh, Christopher Freeland, uh, Minister Freeland, uh, about this, this, this green economy. And I yeah. think that we're probably going to see some details on that today, too. So that's coming up. Oh, oh yeah. And Dr. Vernie Yu, the now former CEO of Alberta Health Services, let go, fired 
And it's been fascinating for me. I mean, there's the political side of it, but then there's also the healthcare side. And I'm most interested to see what healthcare providers have been saying about it. The impression that I get is that Dr. Yu has the confidence of the vast majority. I don't have polling to suggest this. This is my anecdotal observation, but that Dr. Yu has the confidence of healthcare workers, staff, doctors, nurses, support staff, et cetera, across the province. What made this interesting is that my former broadcast colleague, the former leader of Alberta's official opposition, Danielle Smith, who's now re-entering the mix into provincial politics, went on the record, said if she were premier, the very first thing she'd do would be to fire Dr. Yu. Uh, based on pandemic response, but maybe not in the direction you think. Uh, my impression is that Danielle and others uh, figure that maybe Dr. Yu did too much, uh, that, that maybe the, the Alberta didn't follow some of the policies that that others on, on the less intrusive government side would have liked to see. When Danielle Smith went on the record and said the very first thing she would do as premier is to fire Dr. Yu, and then Dr. Yu is fired by this government, by AHS, by the decision makers that be, I think that that sends a pretty clear message as well, doesn't it? I mean, one can only speculate, but that's a big story. And then what I think, to me, probably the biggest story, at least the most significant one, since we were last on air, the Pope apologizing for the Catholic Church's involvement in and legacy when it comes to residential schools. It's an atrocious part of Canada's history, of our story as a nation. And while many people share that involvement in perpetuating these horrific crimes and abuses, genocide against Indigenous people, many were looking to Pope Francis to be the one to make that apology. We're going to get to that in just a moment. And and I'm very much looking forward to a conversation with a good friend of this show, someone who has been covering these issues uh, for quite some time. As a matter of fact, John, why don't we just do it right now? Uh, Brandy Morin, uh, you're familiar with her work, I'm sure, an award-winning freelance journalist. You've you've seen her uh, with the CBC and and Toronto Star and Al Jazeera and the National Observer and El Canada and, and so many other outlets. She was there at the Vatican reporting on this, uh, doing a magnificent job under what I'm sure must have been unbelievably uh, emotional, difficult, and trying circumstances. I'm so grateful to have Brandy joining us this morning. Uh, good morning to you, my friend, and, and, and welcome back home. What, I mean, as a journalist, as a human being, what an experience for you. Tom, say yes, I'm still uh, kind of re- recuperating from it all. It was like a storm. Um, it was incredible to be able to be there to witness literally history unfold. Uh, Brandy, I, I'm most interested, obviously, in, in your assessment and, and your observations. You, your reporting was incredible and, and continues uh, to make an impact, I know, on thousands of people because I've seen the comments and I've seen what people are saying. Um, let's, I want to summarize just a little bit. I want to read just a little bit of, of the apology that the Pope delivered and, and then get your take on it. You know, he said as part of his apology, quote, listening to your voices, I was able to to enter into and be deeply grieved by the stories of the suffering, hardship, discrimination and various forms of abuse that some of you experienced, particularly in the residential schools. He said it's chilling to think of determined efforts to instill a sense of inferiority, to rob people of their cultural identity, to sever their roots and to consider all of the personal and social effects that this continues to entail, unresolved traumas that have become intergenerational traumas. He said he feels two things very strongly, indignation and shame, sorrow and shame for the role that a number of Catholics, particularly those with educational responsibilities, have in all of these things. He says, I ask for God's forgiveness, and I want to say to you with all my heart, I am very sorry. Uh, Generally speaking, or as specific as as you'd like to get, how did the apology land with you, Brandy? And what did you see from the indigenous delegates that you were there with at the Vatican? 
Yes, yeah, so I arrived uh, with the delegates uh, the Saturday prior, and I was reporting on assignment for Al Jazeera English. So the week entailed uh, private one-on-one -on -one meetings with the Inuit, Métis, and First Nation delegates uh, with the Pope. There wasn't an apology expected. This has, has been something that survivors and their families and advocates have been uh, requesting of the Catholic Church for decades, literally, and all the other churches that were involved in these, you know, concentration camps for children have apologized. The delegates had invited the Pope to Indigenous lands in Canada, and they thought, well, maybe the apology might happen there. So on that Friday, when he held the general audience and was providing the response after these meetings that had been held. I was tuning in from the Vatican press room, uh, which was adjacent to uh, St. Peter's uh, Square and inside Vatican City, where uh, this audience was being held in a palace with the Pope and the indigenous delegates. Mm. It was being translated uh, from Italian. And I was at the back and I was trying to listen closely uh, through my lap laptop. And when it came to the part where he said, you know, I am very sorry, it took my breath away. Mm -hmm. Like I was stunned. I, you know, was with my colleagues and I said, he just apologized. The whole week had been just an, an insane whirlwind. And then to hear those words and to realize what had just happened, it was absolutely stunning. And what I did was I ran out to St. Peter's Square right after and was waiting for the delegates to come outside of the room to address the media. They came out and it had been raining in Rome for three days straight. Sometimes it was raining in buckets. After the apology, the skies literally cleared. Oh, wow. And the delegates came out and there was beams of light shining on them. The chief, uh, who is, you know, the head delegate for the Assembly of First Nations, um, Chief Antoine, he said, you know, uh, this was a divine moment. And, um, you know, I was taking in the media scrum. There was all this chaos. And I heard drums in the distance. And I heard singing. And the St. Peter's Square is this huge, huge area with this massive basilica and columns and statues of saints and angels. And so I just, I followed, I just instinctively followed the drums that I heard. And I ran over there and I just witnessed an amazing sight. And um, Chief Little Child, who I've been following for years, he's from Musquachis, Alberta. It happened to be his 78th birthday. He has been advocating advocating for years for this. He's met with two previous posts. He uses a walker now. He stepped outside of his walker and he started dancing in celebration. To witness that moment was just um, so, so phenomenal. There was celebratory round dancing that broke out and the locals were all um, joining in. And I was just so grateful to be there. It was like it was like a burden had literally lifted that I had felt throughout the week, and um, you know, you know, it, when that lifted, we had an opportunity to really try to take in and understand what this means. You, uh, I mean, when you just mentioned Doctor Littlechild's name, I got a chill up my spine, and I've watched that video that you posted of him dancing there in in st peter's square like 15 times and uh it's it's remarkable he he is an incredible person a residential school survivor himself a commissioner uh for the truth and reconciliation and his 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 body of work his life's work yeah. is I, I mean unbelievable and that was his birthday wasn't it didn't he make some comment to you about how that was like uh, just an incredible gift on on his birthday i can't i can't even imagine and every single delegate there um, and the millions of people watching around the world, most particularly indigenous people, the survivors of these residential schools are bringing their own perspectives and so many different lived yeah. experiences and feelings and observations uh, to the mix. How do you process 
something like that. I, I bet. Are you continuing to process it? I mean, is this something yeah. you think will continue to yeah. land? Yeah. Ryan, I mean, so I'm an intergenerational survivor. My cook, my grandmother attended residential school in St. Albert. She's passed away now. I was thinking of her a lot. I was thinking of the generations of trauma that we carry and of all the stories of the survivors and the uh, horrific accounts of abuse and neglect and death that I have heard over the years. And even before going to Rome, going to meet Willie and um, going with him where he searched for graves just a few months ago in his own community and telling me how he carried the coffin, the wooden box of a six-year-old unnamed boy that had been repatriated to them among, you know, some children from there and reburying them. And him telling me, you know, his honor that, that could have been me. But while I was there, it was, it was like I carried all of these stories and it was incredibly heavy. It was incredibly stormy. I kept breaking down in tears. I questioned whether I'd be able to get through the week. But when it came to Friday, it was all worth it. It doesn't mean that um, the hurt and the trauma is completely cleared away, but there was definitely something that happened in order for us to start walking into true justice, healing, and reconciliation with the church. Because beforehand, as uh, Wilton Littlechild told me, forgiveness with the Catholic Church couldn't even begin because there hadn't been an acknowledgement of any wrongdoing before. There's a number of steps that uh, need to be taken now, and people are at various stages of healing. There are people that are still grappling with these atrocities and hurting and um, kind of numb to everything that's going on. And there's no right or wrong, wrong way to go about, you know, this journey of um, healing and reconciliation. Brandy, one of the things, the points that you made on your Twitter, and people can follow you at songstress28. If you're just tuning in live streaming on the Mixler audio app, we're talking to journalist Brandy Morin, who's just recently returned uh, from Italy. She was at the Vatican uh, reporting on the Pope's apology. And, and I should share with our audience as well that the, you've just recently posted um, your reporter's notebook, which is an amazing resource. People can read it at aljazeera.com. It's kind of a, almost like a, it's like a journal, right? It's like a behind the scenes day by day account of who you talked to and what was going through your mind as you spoke with them, et cetera. But you told us, you shared with us by way of your Twitter account that you were hearing that a lot of the survivors or the advocates that were there at the Vatican were, were actually kind of being piled on. They were being heavily criticized uh, yeah. for, for actually being there, right? Or for meeting with the Pope. Can, can you give us some insight into that? Yeah, so there are a lot of like survivors and community members that really don't want anything to do with the church because of these, um, you know, abuses and um, a lot of the delegates that were there, you know, uh, were attacked online, you know, for being there, which is, you know, really sad to see. And apparently some of them even stopped uh, posting uh, photos and um and, and, and other posts of their time in Rome. I mean, it's just really indicative of um, the, just the complete trauma that was inflicted upon our communities because the family systems and the, um, you know, the indigenous societal, you know, governance was completely, um, you know, destroyed by colonialism, destroyed by these uh, residential schools. And the fallout of that uh, is still uh, being experienced. Still, people are struggling. There are, uh, you know, massive addictions. There are massive, um, you know, um, um, you know, suicides and uh, different um, adverse uh statistics that are happening across our communities that stem from colonial violence that stem from uh, you know these residential schools so that brings me to another point by the way the catholic church still owes residential school survivors and their families multi-million dollars they made an agreement um 
years ago in 2006 as part of the as part of the Indian residential school uh, settlement, which was like one of the largest uh, settlements in Canadian history. They promised to pay at that time $30 million. Now it's estimated that they owe $60 million. They have not paid it yet. It's been, you know, almost 20 years and the money was supposed to go towards um, the survivors and intergenerational survivors to help them in this healing process. I was just speaking to um, the executive director of the Indigenous Residential Schools Survivor Society out of British Columbia just a couple of days ago, Angela White, and she told me they cannot keep up. They they need more resources. They need to hire more, uh, you know, counselors and um, traditional, you know, uh, ceremonial like healers, you know, to help on this healing process that is so, so desperately needed. I want to uh, remind our audience members that uh, obviously we understand that this content uh, and this subject matter can be extremely upsetting. And there are resources available. Canada's Indian Residential School Survivors and Family Crisis Line is available 24 hours a day at one 866 925 Forty-four, nineteen, Brandy. One of the things you managed to blur the lines in journalism uh, in, in the most wonderful way. Uh, you are able to, and you do approach your work, and you have consistently done so. I think we've known each other for about ten years, and and I've watched what you do, and there is a lot of heavy lifting, and you're not afraid to share about the impact that that has on you. And I think that that's such an important element of your storytelling. You tweeted just a short time ago, uh, following this experience, quote, I struggled in Rome, you said, you told us, more than you anticipated. Emotionally, spiritually, physically, you tweeted the nightmares, waking up not able to catch your breath, your heart beating out of your chest. You say, I'm back home now, but last night the nightmares continued. This is part of this work and it's trauma. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not kind of standard journalism what you're doing as, as an indigenous person, as an intergenerational survivor. I, I mean, how do you manage what comes with this? How, how are you holding up? You know what? This is not just a job for me. This is a purpose. This is a calling that I am um, deeply, deeply committed to and passionate about. And yes, I am affected. And uh, I, I'm just privileged to be able to tell our stories from an Indigenous viewpoint, as an Indigenous woman, as an Indigenous uh, international, intergenerational survivor who is navigating myself, the reclamation of my Indigenous identity and maneuvering through this healing process. I mean, um, it's continuous trauma, this work. 90% of the work that I do, whether it's uh, survivors or missing and murdered Indigenous women or, you know, poverty or just a lot of these, um, you know, these ailments that our people are struggling with. There, there are a lot of different positives, but my, my focus is to uplift um, the, you know, these human rights uh, violations that are happening to mm. our people. So it is extremely heavy. I often, when I go on the road to assignment, I learn to take uh, s- sleeping pills with me mm. because if I need them, the nightmares are atrocious. And I'm, I'm personally affected by that trauma. But what I find is once I get the story out there, whether it's written or whether it's broadcast, I find that there's a release that happens. And when that story gets out there, when, you know, the voices of these, um, you know, of these people that I'm showcasing, um, it's just, I, I feel um, lighter and I, it's, it's just, um, you know, and, and I just get um, more determined uh, to uh, keep doing this because our stories haven't really been brought to the world and our, our world and our society is in a place where, they're very hungry now to learn these truths and to learn about our people and to uh, understand these stories. So I'm just getting started. I was, I've been working for National Geographic. I was traveling with them, you know, last summer. I'm working on a couple of, you know, documentaries and I have a book that's coming out this summer, my very first first book, Our Voice of Fire, uh, which documents my journey, journey to becoming this 
Journalists for Justice, and uh, also a couple of features to be published yet out of Rome. So um, it gets really tough, but I've been telling myself today, um, it's, it's all worth it because um, I think we're starting really to break through and people are starting to see to see our people. Yeah. Uh, journalists for justice. I love, uh, that's how I'm introducing you moving forward. Every other time, <laughs> every time we're going to talk after this, that's how I'm introducing you. you. You, we've been reminded so many times from, you know, the, the voices that matter on this program in the context of truth and reconciliation that it has to start with truth. And the truth, uh, comes about, uh, in many different ways. One of them is uh, in-depth journalism and long form storytelling like you're doing and like you're committed to do. Um, you, you met with a woman uh, by the name of, uh, was it Lorelai? Is that right? Yeah. Lorelai Williams. Um, yeah. and, and you posted this stunning photo in front of the Roman Coliseum with her. This, this, um, is it a shawl that she's wearing? Very significant. Can you tell us about her? You talked about, um, you know, nightmares and things like that. And, sh and uh, per your reporter's notebook at aljazeera.com, I was reading it before we spoke today. She shared something pretty powerful that, that you tell your readers really yeah. resonated with you in, in, in a tragic context, but, but boy, is it ever powerful. Yeah. So I'm going to be, I'm writing a feature uh, on Lorelai and she's also in our documentary. She um, was not a part of the official delegation. She found out about it and she paid her own way there. She's a well-known international advocate for missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. But both of her parents attended the uh, residential school in Mission, BC, and both of them are deceased. I think Lorelai is only about 42 and her mother, as she believes, died by drinking herself to death because of the uh, abuses that she experienced. So she wanted to be there because she knew that this uh, was significant and she wanted to you know, be there on behalf of her parents to witness. But as we were doing an interview in front of the Colosseum in Rome where you know, gladiators once fought to the death you know, and home of these uh, great fabled warriors, I knew that I was in a, in the presence of a warrior when I was interviewing her and she started sharing about her mother and um, some of the impacts that um, the residential school had had on her life. But I completely broke when she shared that her whole life, her mother could never sleep with the lights turned off because of the things that were done to her in the dark at the residential school. And I just, it dawned on me because my cookum was the same and um, her whole life until she passed away, she always had to have the light on. And I just never knew why. I just knew that she was fearful. She was such a strong woman too. So it didn't make sense to me. Mm. And then when she shared that with me, I thought that's why. And um, yeah, it was just, I had a lot of really, uh, you know, kind of um, aha moments and um, it was, yeah, it was really powerful. So this is a step forward for sure. Um, I mean, I, I, I didn't actually realize, to be honest, I, I learned, I mean, I learned something every time I talked to you, but I, I, I didn't, when you say that you were, you, you weren't expecting an apology, you were surprised to hear an apology. And one of the first things I noted is when you had arrived in Rome, right, you were actually like your initial response was a little bit critical. You felt like the situation was kind of being overmanaged, like there was going to be limited oh. media access, right? Yeah, um, it was. <laughs> <laughs> it was the Vatican was trying to control. They, they they were controlling the narrative in regards to media access and how they wanted um, things portrayed. So yeah. we were given very, very limited access. So I was a little bit frustrated with that. But it's uh, I mean, I guess now you get to a point where. Um, you know, we have our recommendations, almost 100 of them here uh, in Canada uh, from this Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I know that a lot of people it's, it's interesting. We talk to people, whether they're organizational leaders or whether they're advocates or just e even people personally that will say that they, they're, they're trying to treat it like a checklist and they're trying to make meaningful. And a lot of people keep it to themselves. And this is their personal journey. And a lot of other people, I think, are, are trying to do it a little bit more out in the open, whether it's to set an example or perhaps to, to in, in their context, depending who they represent or who they are, to try to make things right. 
I guess mm. now, you know, a, a big one, when it, when it came to a lot of people's expectations, they wanted to see an apology from the Vatican. Uh, and now people may say, what are the next steps? You've talked about reparations. I know that there are uh, indigenous artifacts that a lot yeah, of people. I saw them. Yeah, can you tell us about those and, and maybe what the future of that might look like? I mean, was there any commitment yeah. that you picked up on to maybe return those to where they belong? Yeah. So I had been on a tour of the Vatican Museum with the delegates and um, stayed with them for a while, but it was just really crowded with a lot of different tourists and stuff. So I kind of slipped away on my own and I ended up literally stumbling into this area where they were preparing to showcase this indigenous collection. And I was kind of stunned because I wasn't expecting it and I didn't really know about it. I had heard about it, but I wasn't looking for it at that time. And I came upon these statues at first and they were like life-size life size statues. And one of them depicted an indigenous man. It was called the dying indigenous man. And, and I just thought like, wow, here we are, here, here we are in this, you know, this ancient city with these delegates, these indigenous delegates that have traveled across the world and they're still here. We're still here. We aren't dying out. And I seen, um, you know, this um, headdress, which is, it's a, it's a ceremonial item and other ceremonial items being procured. And they were behind like this glass wall and this office. And I was just, um, I was kind of bothered by it because, you know, our people, you know, these are items that were pillaged and stolen and put on display as if we are something of the past. And so I know that the delegates did um, call for them to be re- returned and the Inuit um, the ITK leader, leader Natan Obed actually met with, um, I guess, the head curator uh, shortly after, and they're in talks to have the mm-hmm. items returned. Which I think, first of all, is is an obvious next step. Um, and second of all, I, I think, you know, I, I would imagine that that would be pretty meaningful for a lot of people that, that would like to see further actions taken, right? Like, this isn't the type of situation uh, where, you know, the, the Pope apologizes and then all, all of a sudden everything's cool. Uh, mm-hmm. There's so much work still to be done. And, and we've learned on this program about the idea of these seven generations and, 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 yeah. and, and the seven generations that it would take to truly mm-hmm. uh, address and heal, ultimately, not ever forget, but heal uh, from these atrocities here at home. Uh, you, I mean, we, we, we've shown, I mean, you, you talked to, you know, survivors from Miraval and you've been to Cowessis for, I mean, you, you've traveled all, all over Brandy and your reporting shows that again, we're talking to Brandy more and you can check out her, her Twitter at songstress 28 and link to just the incredible stories that she's told, uh, the visual elements of your work as well, Brandy remarkable, but. Oh, but, I got to I got to shout out my girl, Amber Bracken. Yeah. But big Edmontonia. Yeah. She's Edmontonian, and guess what? Today she won the world press photo of the year she beat out, beat out over 63,000 entries and her photo is from the Kamloops residential school. I'm so proud of her and we worked together on a lot of projects. She was with me in Rome. And so, um, you know, it's her um, incredible portraits that accompany a lot of my work. And I'm working with filmmaker Gordy Day of Night School Films based out of Calgary to document these historic events. Yes, that's the photo. It's, there was that, that rainbow that you see there, that was actually landing on the former residential school oh at that God. moment in the background. Like, just absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> Amber's been on the show before. She was, she was, uh, she was, what was she? She's at Fairy Creek, I think, if I remember correctly. We, we were talking to no. her. She, she, Wet'suwet'en, probably. Wet'suwet'en, that must have been, yeah, yeah. it was uh, a few months ago. She's just, she, what a talent she is. And this, this photo, I don't, we're showing it on our YouTube right now. I don't even, yeah. I don't have the words for it. And that's kind of the whole point of I'm photos, so proud of her. Yeah, she does. I'm really amazing proud of job. her. She, to me, is a portrait of reconciliation. She does so much work in our communities and she's humble and she's committed and passionate and just, um, just her, her, her work just shines. And she's helped me through when we go on the road and I'm experiencing trauma and I'm just so, so p- proud of her. And she didn't even like when she talked about uh, when she shared that she won this a week ago uh, before it was announced, she wasn't even excited about like any of the attention mm. that she would get. She was more happy that 
the uh, genocide of indigenous children was going to be exposed to the world. And um, so I just, I, I honor her and mm. am proud of her. Well, I, I mean, I sure don't speak for Amber, but, uh, but I do, <laughs> I do know that um, she pours herself into her work and yeah. uh, it's very evident. And, and I think that you can probably relate to that Brandy. Um, We're a good team. <laughs> yeah, you sure are. Can I, uh, can I ask you in closing, um, you know, for, for an assignment, like, can, can, can you give us, I mean, you know, people that are, that are here in Canada, regardless of background, um, are going to want to know, I mean, the, the, obviously it's, it's impossible to ignore the magnitude of, of a papal apology and, and this whole story, but you know, people are going to say, what's next? Like, mm. what do we do next? What are the next steps for, for people in Canada? What, you know, what, what's an assignment or what's something that's really on your radar? Having spoken to survivors one-on-one, -on -one, I mean, you're putting faces to stories, right. which is the most powerful way to tell them. Uh, what's your assignment to the rest of us? You know, you were talking about the calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. That's uh, resources that have, that is available to anybody. They're available online. And something that um, Chief Wilton Littlechild, you know, has recommended to me before is to advise people to go through those calls to action and pick one or two of them that speaks to you and start there. Start within your own communities. Start with the conversations at your table. Start with learning your true history. Start with whose land you're on and understanding that. Because guess what? We weren't educated in the school system. That was st strategic in order for the general pub public to really not understand the agenda of, you know, um, colonization and the genocide that was taking place. So we have a lot of learning to do together going forward and so just get to know your neighbor and don't be afraid to reach out brandy morin is uh, an award-winning journalist uh, out of treaty six territory in alberta canada a journalist for justice you can read her reporter's notebook at aljazeera.com walking to justice canada's residential school survivors and of course give her a follow if you don't already at songstress 28 on twitter you can follow her on instagram as well brandy it's it's always a huge honor to connect with you keep up the incredible work hi hi ryan thank you for all the work you're doing on your show for reconciliation take care appreciate it brandy thanks so much you can let us know uh how this conversation is landing with you uh, I mentioned it earlier today. We know that real talkers uh, come at this program from so many different perspectives. Uh, many of you uh, with lived experience, uh, many of you intergenerational survivors of residential schools in Canada. We know that because you tell us that. Talk at ryanjesperson.com is our inbox. And of course, we'll leave time uh, in the shows to come. Uh, to get to some of your thoughts about what you've just heard, make sure you check out Brandy's work. It really is incredible, incredible stuff. These interviews happen because we have sponsors uh, that, that have our back, that are committed to the difficult and meaningful conversations that matter most. And that includes the family-owned business at Eden Landscaping. It's the time of year where people are starting to look outside to their own outdoor spaces Maybe start dreaming about how they could be reinvented, how they could be brought to life. That's what Eden Landscaping does. Whatever your vision is, they'll execute it with precise attention to detail. Check them out online. You can check out their services, their portfolio, whether it's garden boxes you're envisioning, maybe maybe excavation, run a gas line out to your garage, get a thermostat in there, a nice natural gas heater for next winter. Don't do what I do. I wait until like November, and then I start looking around to get a trench dug for a gas line. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you never guess, Johnny, you, you, you probably aren't going to get the best price or the availability of anybody if you wait until the very last minute to get your work done. So Obviously. today's a great day to get in touch with Eden Landscaping. A shout out to them. Our friends at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park are super excited about their brand new lineup of the loaded signature 
stack burgers, the loaded steakhouse one. That's one of my favorites. The bacon two cheese deluxe, the flamethrower signature stack burger. Make it a, a single, a double, a triple, whatever you like. These are the Dairy Queens in Sherwood Park at Baseline Road and Northwest Edmonton at Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, and Westmount. When you visit them, you make sure you let them know that you're there because you heard about them on Real Talk. Our friends at Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge want to let you know that they're well aware this is the time of year you're going to start thinking about how you're going to get your family out to your favorite campground, maybe on Crown Land, maybe one of those full service units. Are you pulling a trailer out there? Are you pulling a boat out there? Do you need to upgrade your ride? They've got not just a fantastic selection of new inventory, including that brand new beautiful Jeep Wagoneer, the Ram trucks, but their pre-owned selection as well. You can browse it all online. Just check out the Sponsors tab on our website, ryanjesperson.com. Local environmental services operating in the prairies, Alberta and Saskatchewan in particular, for a quarter century now, still family-owned, consistently broadening their service and, of course, their footprint as well into new communities. They've got portable toilets, fencing, water hauling, recycling and landfill management, front load bins, the big roll-off bins. Do you have a renovation project looming if so or if you're a business that would look for a better deal maybe a better relationship with whoever's managing your waste and recycling collection we recommend local environmental at localenvironmental.ca and of course our friends at park power want to remind you they're about more than just power internet electricity natural gas and if you bundle all three services you're going to save on those admin fees. Plus, with the promo code 2022-REALTALK, they're going to knock $70 off your first bill. You can compare rates today. You can learn a little bit more about how it all works when you join them, your friendly local utilities provider at parkpower.ca. Powering our hashtag, every show, RealTalkRJ. Well, it's been great to be back with you today, friends, and we appreciate you tuning in for giving us your valuable time, for sharing your perspectives with us as we continue on this journey together. We mentioned it's budget day today, and of course, that means tomorrow we'll have full analysis of what this government envisions the next number of months looking like when it comes to Canada's economic recovery and emergency. Fiscal challenges included. Sapria Devetti will join me tomorrow morning. You won't want to miss it right out of the gates. Plus, our traditional Friday Real Talk Roundtable. We're going to get into the idea of community. We'll see you then. Real Talk is hosted by Ryan Jesperson. Technical producer, John Hicks. Managing director, Josh Dunford. Account coordinator, Tanya Franklin. General Manager, Katie Cook-Chivers. Website Design, Mike Johnston. voiceover by me, Carrie Skelton. Real Talk's editorial board is Supriya Duvetti, Ahmed Ali, Anne Castleman, Corey Hogan, Harmon Candola, Catherine O'Neill, and Chris Henderson. Member Emerita, Julie Rohr. Real Talk is recorded in Edmonton, Alberta on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional and ancestral territory of the Cree, Dene, Blackfoot, Salto, and Nakota Sioux, home to Métis Settlements and the Métis Nation of Alberta. Real Talk is the flagship property of Relay Communications Group Incorporated. All rights reserved. For more, check out ryanjesperson.com.